Um, I'm Zaina Barakat. I'm a storyteller here at IDEO. And I am Mark Magellan, and I too am a storyteller here at IDEO. And the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to be hosting a kind of a Q&A with you all live. We're super excited to be here, and we're so excited to field your questions. And also, it's just been so cool to kind of be a fly on the wall and watch some of the interactions that are going on within the course. So much great discussion. There's so many cool stories that you all have been inspiring us. So thank you for that. Um, but we'll be getting started here any minute now. Aloha. Someone just said aloha. Where's you aloha? You guys, please send us uh, your hellos by telling us your name and where you're from, where you're joining us from. And you'll see. Hello. Yeah, I see a hello there from Steve. Hey, Steve, what's going on? <laughs> and I don't know where you're from, Steve, but I imagine somewhere really cool in the world. We got oh, Anna. Anna from Copenhagen. Hello, Anna. Copenhagen. I've never been to Copenhagen. Have you been to Copenhagen? No. No, no I haven't Jessie either. Jesse from Denver. Jesse from Hi, Denver. Jessie. Hello. Is it still cold oh, in Denver, Jesse? Look, we're getting so many hello. Dara and Matt. Monterey, Mexico. All right, Seattle, sunny Seattle. From Seattle. So yeah, we're gonna let's let's give a, we'll do a quick introduction again of ourselves. Um, maybe just start telling some stories and see how it goes from there. Yeah. But uh, yeah. and uh, we're ready for your questions whenever you want to send them in. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I uh, I'm Zaina from uh, IDEO. I'm a storyteller here, and um, I have. I sort of come from a journalism background, years of experience um, in broadcasts and documentaries, and uh, I was at the New York Times before I came to IDEO. Um, and here I do all sorts of storytelling, from writing to making videos and working on communications and branding and all of that. Um, so that's what that's what I do here. So has done like everything. She has all of this experience in the field of storytelling. And I'm Mark. Um, also came from a background of journalism. Um, I've also developed courses for folks. I work actually specifically with IDOU, so super, um, super close to the contents that you all are experiencing now, which is super cool. And uh, yeah, I've also, I've also spent a lot of time working with film, um, very short films, and also worked at a production company. Yeah. Things like that. So we're here to answer your questions. So please send us some questions. Um, or else I'm gonna keep telling you about Sadie Benning and um, how her whole life story, which you know she also then, after I told you about Sadie Benning before in the previous version of this feed, I, um, you know, she joined the punk rock group La Tigra, just so you guys know. She's really badass. Nice. She's sort of my storytelling hero. Um, okay, do we have some questions? You want this oh. one? Yeah. Okay, so we have a question which is, oh. where, what do you do to find inspiration? I mean, it's like, that's such an amazing question. Yeah. You want to you wanna kick us off? Sure. Um, I mean, I think one place, uh, there are two places that I'm really finding most inspiration right now. I love uh, places that sort of break with typical storytelling form or storytelling form that's outside of my own. So. I've gotten really into graphic novels, um, and I've actually started a graphic novel book club at IDEO. Yeah. Uh, so people come and share different authors that they really care about, and you know, I'm I'm not a graphic uh, novel writer or artist, but what I love about it is the visuals and the storytelling and how it kind of takes leaps in imagination. You can do things in graphic novels and in films that you can't do, uh, let's say, more realistic documentary storytelling and I love that um, and also in podcasts I think the podcast world is just exploding with a lot of creativity right now so I love podcasts that take a lot of risks totally I mean building on that podcasts like almost every day on the way to work I listen to like a radio lab or this American life there's so much beautiful stuff going on out there um, I think music to me is super important um, staying inspired i always have like tunes and sometimes getting up and out of the office getting walking also i think sometimes for inspiration um for writers specifically it's it's so important to, to be reading um 
to be exploring what's going on out there creatively with film and other mediums. Because I think that that's really where we gather a lot of a lot of our inspiration, where we can learn better crafts. But I mean, I think one of the most important things as a storyteller is to is to stay inspired. Because I really believe that. You know, we're not. If we're, how are we ever going to be able to inspire others unless we ourselves remain inspired? Yeah. So that's that's. So. What else do we have? Oh, cool. So this question is. Okay, as a giver of feedback, what are some things uh, I need to pay attention to? Hmm. So that's really that's a cool perspective because you're saying instead of receiving feedback, actually, I, I'm beginning as giving feedback. What's most helpful? Um, yeah, I mean, as a giver of feedback, things to pay attention to. I mean, I think, I think it's your goal. You know, if you're if you're giving feedback, your feedback is in service of the person that you're providing the feedback to. So I think that that feedback should be coming from a place of really good intention and growth. You want to be helping that person's story. So I think it's super important sometimes to kind of divorce the ego from the feedback and, and not say, hey, you know, this point I don't like. Because it's like, you know, you want, you want to really help Zana or whoever's writing that story like build upon what they've already created. So I think taking the ego away is super important and just actually coming with a mindset of curiosity and just really wanting to help this person tell a better story for me is super, super important before you even get started. I also think it's really good to ask the storyteller some questions about okay. what their intention is, who the intended audience yeah. is. So you're not listening to that story in your own shoes, but sort of in the shoes of the audience that, that it's meant to be for. Um, and you sort of understand, so tell me about this audience. Why, what are you trying to tell them? Um, where are you gonna be? Where are they gonna hear this message? How long do you have their attention for? Understand the context. Um, if you understand everything surrounding that story and where it's gonna to be told, you, your feedback can be much more powerful because it's coming from the perspective of the intended audience, not just from the, from your shoes and what your likes and dislikes are. So I think that's a really helpful thing. We'll start from there. That's awesome. So, cool, we have more questions. How do I, I ask for the most effective feedback? Uh -huh. Nice. So we're kind of flipping it a bit, right? The first was how do I give feedback? And this next one is how do I, the storyteller, ask for feedback? Do you want, yeah. to, you want me to kick off? Well, you go, go for it again. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there are a few things that are super important with any story. Um, I think you really need to consider um, what type of feedback you're looking for. I think it's important to give constraints around the feedback. So for example, if I am I'm writing a story and it's at a super early stage and it's at that very structural level, I might be asking for like more structure, structural feedback, like, hey, what of these main points doesn't make sense? How does this story fall short? What's missing? Um, what really resonates? And then maybe after revs and revs, as we go kind of through the iterative loop, right, and I'm getting closer to what I think might be like closer to finalized story, I might be asking for those more like copy edit type feedback from someone, but I think it's super, super important to like lay down the constraints and ask that person giving feedback, um, like, this is what I'm looking for, because that really guides them to give you super productive feedback. And also, um, so that's a matter of, of really when, um, it's, it's important for us as storytellers to kind of set that journey and, and to know the different times that you're going to be asking for feedback and then build in um, times kind of rev it and, and keep going. Yeah, and I think when you're asking for <laughs> feedback, sorry. Hi, uh, London folks. Yeah, there's a from London. Um, I think also when I'm asking for feedback, um, it's really important who, do you, who you go to. Um, some people are really good at giving feedback at different points in the process. So you have some uh, friends who are really good at feedback that sort of um, maybe earlier in the process could give you feedback to build up your idea or sort of get you to a more creative place. And those are the people to put earlier in the process. And later in the process, you might want people who are more cutting, who are going to tell, you, tell it to you like it is and get it to a more refined place that you need to go. So um, I think it's really also think, who am I asking for feedback at what point in the process? And so, um, <laughs> so uh, you know, that, that's also something to think about when you're asking for feedback. It's, um, also, it's also like with feedback, 
Man, it's super, sometimes it's super tough to get. I think we should also, when we're done, we should crumple them up, throw them over our shoulder. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Yeah, okay, so we're gonna use this one. One, two, three. Okay, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I mean, as a storyteller, it's, it's, it's tough sometimes getting feedback yeah. and asking for feedback. I mean, we don't, we try to have tough skin, but like oftentimes, you know, you hear from tons of different people and different things to, to, to change. And you can't, I guess you, again, you kind of have to take your ego out of that yeah. and, and just like embrace it as a collective process. And storytelling really is, it's like the better the story, the more perspective has, has gone into building it. I think, I think it's like a really beautiful thing when you actually have like a collaborative story. So what else do so we have? Keep asking us questions. Keep sending them in. Okay. Ooh. So this is from Reagan in Cincinnati. Hello, Reagan. Hello, Reagan. And it says, hey, I'm struggling with striking the balance between organizing my arguments and telling my story. Do you hear those birds, by the way? It's not us. It's <laughs> right outside. So I'm, uh, so I'm struggling with striking the balance between organizing my argument and telling my story. I'm seeing prototypes that make the case more than tell the story. Thoughts or advice? Okay. So, I think when you're struggling with organizing to make your argument and telling the story you want to tell, you really want to think, at what point am I putting in the story and for what purpose? And is it furthering my argument or is it taking my audience to a new place and they're kind of losing sight of my argument? So. It is really hard to strike that balance, but what you want to do is really think of what are the emotional high points you want to hit. So for example, let's say you want to start out with an emotional story to bring people in. Um, and this is it's hard to do it kind of out of context here, but uh, so let's say you start with a story in the beginning. And let's say you spend some time making arguments, but if there are some arguments that are more emotional and less intellectual, you might want to bring in another story there or match the two things where an intellectual argument gets paired with an emotional moment. Um, so you really want uh, the stories to uh, you know, lift up your argument and, and not uh, the other way, not distract from your, argu from your argument. So really what you want to do is try it out with people um, and sort of try out both. Try out one where you kind of lean heavier on the argument and one where you lean heavier on the, in the story and see which ones are effective. Most of the time I find that when I practice these things out with people, I see where the reactions are in the audience and I know where I'm really connecting with people and where I start glazing over. That's where you know uh, that you're kind of leaning one way or the other too heavily. That's what it says. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Okay, it's over that. So, let's far. see, we had... Okay. Can you share some of your favorite stories <laughs> or the brief of a story you really loved? Whew. Mark, you so get to say Some that. of my <laughs> favorite stories. I think I'm going to say like a bunch of Disney films or something. Um, some of my very, uh, some of my favorite stories. I mean, offhand, I don't, I don't know what story comes to mind, and maybe I'll think about it as we dig a bit deeper, but I know that there are a few effective elements that every story that I love has. Yeah. And um, I think that this is also something that you'll probably be exploring a bit deeper in the course, but I think you know every story kind of has that, those anecdotes, those like put you in the room type moments. This happened and then that happens. Like the most mundane of stories, right? Like he was sitting at his desk in the office and everything was super quiet and still. And then he got up and he walked over into the refrigerator. But he couldn't get over it, this uncanny silence that was in the office, right? Nothing's happening in that story that I'm telling, but it's a sequence of events that one's leading you to the next, and it's actually building suspense. And it has like, the underlying question of like, why is it so still and silent, right? So I think that every story that I really love will have the build of the sequence, which we call anecdote. But then I think that the, what makes the good from the bad story, or maybe the resonant to the story that doesn't really like pull at your heartstrings, is that moment of reflection, that pause that really tells you like, 
hey, this is why I'm telling this story. This is why it matters. So like cue into this. So I think that when you balance those, the sequence, you can create that rhythm where people are like, I wonder where this is going to go. But then you do remind them of those key moments of why they're listening. To me, that those make for the most effective stories. Yeah. So, I mean, film does that. Um, tons of podcasts do that. We totally. do it. We do it here. So those guys. Yeah. I'm gonna. I have a story to share, but I'm going to come back to this if you don't mind with a story that I love in a little bit. Yeah. We're gonna intersperse our favorite stories. <laughs> I'm gonna write down a note for myself, so. Don't forget. Yeah, we can all come back to favorite stories, huh? Okay. So we're gonna answer another question, and we'll come back to that. Um, just for some suspense and some silence. Just kidding. Okay. Tips. Tips on narrowing the story. How do I focus? I have tons of info and now I feel lost more than ever. Help, where to begin? Whew. Oh my God, take a break. Get away from your story, you're too close to it. <laughs> that is the number one thing that I do. I, I try, I know sometimes we feel like we've got too much going on. But if there's a way, you can get away and come back to it in a couple days, you will be so much more clear headed. Also, mm -hmm. what you wanna do is Work on your story, give it some distance. Also tell your story to someone else. I find that often when I'm working on a project um, and I'm struggling with retelling the story, what I experienced, what I saw because I'm too close to it, um, I turn to a friend and I tell them the story. And I say, oh my God, I'm working on this really cool project. And I really pay attention to what things are coming out of my mouth because I know what what I'm focusing on at that moment, and what follow-up questions that person asks are also really notable. So I know to include that. Now I tell the story again, and I tell the story again to a few other people, and I keep changing it and seeing what works. And often that's what leads me to get to the heart of the story. So practice your story on other people. Yeah. I think sometimes when we're too close to a project, we get really attached to the details, and we lose sight of what's important. And more importantly, we lose sight of like the, the turns or the twists or the things that are unexpected that really grab people's interest. So in telling that story and forcing yourself to go out there and tell people that story without a PowerPoint presentation, without anything like that, without any tools, just your voice and a conversational tone, um, you're really forced to get to the crux of what's, what makes your story compelling. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's so true. And just building on what, what was just said, I think also once you've walked away from the story, which is so important, like getting some physical space from it, taking a breather, coming back with like a different mind, a curious mind, but then also like try, like try outlining it. I mean, you might have already done that before, but like what are, what are the main points that you're trying to get across? Sometimes you're really just right, this might be backwards for you all or it's not. But like main point one and main point two, and you get those up on a board and just put them up and rearrange them and see like what sticks. Sometimes you'll tell a story and you realize that some of your main points actually aren't helping to lift up your story. They're not like serving a purpose, so you can quickly figure out like what are the what are the ideas that I have to keep. And then also, I mean, super super important before you before you do any of this is just like. Make sure you know what the big idea is. What's the big idea of the story? What's the one thing you want me to remember as a viewer when I walk out of that presentation, when I leave the movie theater? What do you want me mulling over thinking about? There should be a big idea that if you have stuck up on your computer screen, just as a reminder, it's a super grounding agent for your story. And when someone walks away to retell your story, what do you want them to tell? Totally. And that's what you should focus on because I can tell you sometimes I've had the most logical, practical story that I needed to tell, but the one twist or unexpected thing is a thing that people walk away with and retell. Mm -hmm. and so you really want to know what is that, that really that grabbing thing that people are going to want to read. Because there's going to have to be a compelling, illogical, emotional reason that they're going to want to tell your story again. That's beyond just like the facts. So nice. you want to get at what that, what those like turning points are, those special you want to moments. Do the and that was from that was from Alejandro in Mexico. Thank well, you so help. much for your Ask comment. Ask a follow up if it, if you want to. Also, Alejandro. Who else do we have? Oh yeah. Oh yes. Keep sending questions. Uh, we are seeing a slowdown in the questions. Yeah, yeah. Stop. Please ask us. We will be answering them for some time now. 
So here's one, which is, have you ever had to tell a story you couldn't relate to? All the time. And how did you get over this? I didn't sleep at night. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> no, but I think, I mean, okay. So not all stories are ones that are meant that I tell are ones where I look out into the audience and the people are all exactly like me. Um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, people are a lot older than I am or from a different country or from uh, a different, you know, uh, a career background or whatever it is. Um, and so what you want to really do is really understand your audience. And so and understand what the story is about and who the characters are and what voice is that in. And I honestly, that's where I get the most excitement in my job and as a writer is when I'm co going out of myself mm -hmm. into something that I can't relate to because that means I have to like understand a new behavior, a new perspective, and write in that voice. Mm -hmm. And so instead of seeing it as something that's an obstacle, how can you see it as something that's an opportunity to really put yourself in the shoes of someone else whether it's the character that you're writing the voice from or the audience members who are receiving this message, one that is not meant for you. So I think that's like, that's the fun stuff. That's the hard stuff, but it's really fun. I mean, that's so right. And there's, there's such a challenge if you, if you can't relate. If you, if you feel you can't relate to the story, I think that there's always, there always is the common core that you can relate to, right? That's why we tell human-centered stories here at IDEO, because there is always someone somewhere that kind of possesses those 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 behaviors or has those unmet needs. Um, but if you add to the story, there is something relatable to it automatically. So sometimes it's just it's how can you find the humanness and really soak the humanness out of it so that people can empathize. Because the power of stories really is is that they get like somewhere deep in our brain where we're no longer thinking analytically. We're no longer, we don't have like that naysaying brain going. And we can kind of speak to our core where reason's kind of gone away. So like the real challenge is how do I invite others to have that empathy? And every story, no matter how, how far unrelatable you think it is at first, I'm sure there is some humanity to it. And that's kind of like the beauty of the exploration. So just keep on searching and you'll always find it. Yeah, and I, so I, I'd say very concrete thing, you know, especially when you're thinking about your audience and who's going to be receiving that story, find out what their needs are and what their questions could be. So that means telling your story, doing the best you can and sort of relating to it, telling the story to someone who is in that group that you're trying to reach, seeing what their questions are, and making sure that you're addressing the kind of perspective that they have. So if they're more focused on um, the logistics of how you're going to get something done, are you delivering that kind of message? Are, you, are they focused more on the money aspect? Are they focused more on the emotional aspect? You really need to understand your audience and what their needs are. Uh, so try it out a few times. So very practically speaking, num step number one, know your audience. So you can step out of yourself. Totally, it's so true. Um, I also just saw that we are answering questions live directly from Periscope, so please keep them coming, and we will answer them as oh. the, as they go. That's in response to what I just said. So, what, so it was. So she uh, <laughs> she or he said. Um, so do you need to do observations to tell a story? I think it went away very quickly. Um, I I just think you need to practice, and in practicing, you're going to get a lot of really valuable feedback. Um, and sometimes it is observations, sometimes it's asking questions. I do a lot of calling people ahead of time, but I also, uh, you know, friends who may be associated with something like that and, and getting their feedback. But also I just try out the stories ahead of time and get people's reactions. So I don't know, observations maybe, but it's also just practice, 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 and see what people's reactions are, what sticks and what doesn't. That's awesome. I don't know if that helps. Okay. This question comes I'm from gonna Karen. Ask you, I'm oh. going to ask you this. I'm going to be Karen. Hi, Karen. I'm going to be you. How do you know if your story is strong enough to change someone's belief or behavior? That is... That Preach, is, Karen. <laughs> that is quite the question. Good question. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, you have to really listen to your, your intuition, right? I mean, you probably have 
you probably have a, have a gut feeling as to whether it's going to be able to re resonate with others. But if you actually want to, to experiment with this along the way, you should really try it out. Tell it to your friends. Tell it to colleagues. Tell it to, to family members. The best way to see if something resonates is to actually tell the story, right? And I mean, check, check for body language. Ask for feedback. See what people can actually tell you and how we can push that forward. So I mean, don't wait to just launch your story you know, on the 11th hour just before it's due. Make sure that before that you've invited in people, A, that, that you're comfortable telling the story with at early stages, but also further on that you've constantly tested this with different people. Yeah, and I would say also, if, if what your motivation is to get someone to change a belief, belief or behavior, mm -hmm. you wanna build in either a call to action or some shareability or something online. You want to sort of prompt some sort of behavior so you can track it, um, if that's your goal. So, you know, first of all, where are you targeting these people that you're hoping to change their beliefs or behaviors? And also, are you giving them a way to act on your message so that they can do something about it and send you a message that they have heard it, can they share it, can they donate or do something. So if you just tell them the story and it, the story ends there and there's no call to action, um, you're never going to know if there's a change. Hello. And hello from France, someone just joined us from France, hello, hello, bonjour. This is from, this is from Daryl? Dara. Dara. Is it best to try out your story? Hey, Dara. Um, is it best to try out your story with people who are completely detached? It's an awesome question. What do you think, Zaina? Uh, it depends. <laughs> uh, tell me your story and everything about it, and I'll. And no, I'm just kidding. Okay, I think it's best. It depends. So, um, I think sometimes it's it's just helpful to have people listen to your story who are closest to who your audience is. So um, you want people who are involved because they give you a certain perspective, and you want people who are completely detached if that's what your audience is gonna be. Is your, if, if your audience is completely detached, has no context, um, that is really helpful information because you wanna know, where is my like skip and logic here? Am I making my argument clearly enough? Am I giving enough context or information? Um, that's really helpful. But people who are involved can also help you by giving you tips like, hey, remember that story? Remember that thing we experienced? Remember how we had that visual? So, you know, I think yes and no. I know that's not a satisfying answer, but I think it depends on what you're looking for. Both perspectives, the detached one and one that's closer to you, can give you perspective. But do not only seek information from people who know the project really well, right. um, if your audience is gonna be detached. Totally that's right. gonna be dangerous. Yeah, because they're seeing, they're seeing it through through that, that, that lens, right? I mean, one of the, the most beautiful things about working here at IDEO is we have so many people with such different perspectives, and you don't often work with them day to day, but we you casually collide with them around the office, and something that I find so useful is when I am telling a story, or we're at an early stage of a story, or whether I'm making an outline, whatever it might be, and I can just pull someone like Zaina aside and just say, hey, can like, I pitch this off you real quick, and just like get your immediate feedback, like what really resonates and what's missing. So I think that the detached objective can be super awesome, but it really just depends on like where you're at and what you need and what, what your audience needs. But that is awesome. No, we really had that. <laughs> I just wanted to give you something else for us. Yeah, one, okay. two, one, yeah, one, two, two and three. three. Okay, and now this one. Oh, I get, oh, Dara says she gets concerned people are too close to the story. Huh. If you're concerned, then you're probably right. Yeah, then find And some, you should definitely find, find and you other, have all these cohorts in this class. I mean, come on, make fi, some connections. Yeah, find other folks come and on, just, you know. Come on, that's be, the point of this thing. Yeah, and, and, and you know, kind of embrace that be brave mindset and share, share it to other folks. Yeah, totally. Definitely. But definitely listen to your intu definitely intu intuition with that help. one. So this one's from Mark. It's, it's a strong name. Um, I have to present to some major stakeholders. How do you keep them interested? That's, that's Make a, sure they're fed. No, okay, Mark. <laughs> uh, for real. Uh, you, what you want to do is basically, you know, it's so hard with these things because it's so vague, and, but um, 
you know, you want to tell them what to expect out of what you're about to tell them, but not tell them the whole story up front. So if you know your major stakeholders really want to get to um, sort of the financial plan or something, and that's not the crux of your idea, you want to really get them emotionally involved in your idea and really on board before they get to those details, tell them, we're going to get to that. I know that's what you're thinking about. We're going to get to it. So let me keep you interested by, you know, you know, don't say that, but just say, I know you want these answers. We're going to get there, so let me tell you the case first. Let me tell you the story. So I think as long, much as you can do to sort of get them out of their heads yeah. and into that moment yeah. um, with you by addressing what their concerns are up front and say, if you could hold questions until I get to this point and then let them ask questions. So like really manage expectations and manage the points where you're allowing people to jump in and allowing them to just sort of let go of everything they're thinking and just really pay attention to what you're saying. That Those would be really important points. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and I mean, how do you keep them interested, right? You like, really tell your story in the same way I was talking about using anecdote and kind of this happens, then that happened. I mean, embrace that that storyteller within you and really and use that power and, you know, ask ask questions along the way to the audience, hypotheticals that they won't be answering, but that are used to hook them in, right, and keep them curious. And also, don't be afraid to make things personal. Make it personal, bring in humans, bring in stories. You know, the best way to keep them interested is, is sometimes staying away from all the, all that, those statistics and that data, some things that you oftentimes do need, but sometimes all we need is just that human connection to really, really stay like intrigued and compelled. Yeah. Great question, Mark. Great question. Um, okay, I was told that I need to share my favorite story and that I did not <laughs> fulfill that promise. Story time! Okay, so a little story for you. Um, I'm going to talk about a podcast because that's what I do often. There is this podcast called 99% Invisible that a lot of people know about. I like to like talk about obscure podcasts, so I'm not talking about the ones that everyone knows, but I'm just going to tell you about the one that everyone knows. Okay, just because I'm annoying like that. But then, uh, personal, oh... Personal, okay, we can answer that one yeah. in a minute. But, uh, so 99% Invisible did this whole story about the, the sound design around sports, where they add, especially for the Olympics and all these big sporting events, they add sound effects on top of it because they actually can't capture the sound effects at that moment. So the reason I love that story so much, and you should listen to that podcast, was because it took something that was so much a part of my life and had been for so long and made me see it in a whole new way that I didn't expect. And what they did was because it's an audio um, format, you know, they were able to take apart these sounds and just had you listen to the, to the uh, sound effects and then put them on top of the actual sports coverage. And so anything that makes me see something that's already out in the world in a whole new fantastical way, like blows my mind and I love that they're able to do that. And they really took advantage of the audio medium to do it in a beautiful way. So that's one of my favorite stories of all time that I'd share with you. That is awesome. Okay. So. Okay, we have another question. Um, should we answer this one thing first? Sure. Okay, one, concepts? yeah. Well, one thing um, Mark was asking a follow-up, which was, should you make it personal even when it's a business sort of environment or pitch? Mm. It really depends. Mm. It really depends. When, if it's a passion project of yours and there's a reason that it's personal to you and there's a reason that you are the one to make it happen, then absolutely make it personal. But if the personal aspect of it is getting in the way of the reason why you're doing something and getting in the way of the story, then it should not be personal. It should be about the customer, the user, and why it's beneficial to them. So. But you do want to make the case that you are the right person, so it might have to be personal. And, and just a, a slight build on that, you know, in a tweak on making it personal, it, it doesn't necessarily just mean like bringing you in your story. It, it sometimes just means adding adding a hero to the story, adding adding a human, um, talking about about to your end users, those people, and just making bringing it to life by actually making it a bit more human doesn't mean you necessarily have to bring in your story to every business presentation, right? Yeah. 
So it's more about just making it human so folks can relate. We have another, another question. I worry my story is just a mashup of other stories. Is that okay? Do you guys know Girl Talk? Yeah. Right? <laughs> All he does is mash up other people's music, and I love it. It's awesome. So yeah. that's my opinion. Yeah. Sure, you can make it a whole new beautiful thing. It's really hard to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. It really is. That being said. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that's often how we how we learn to find our voice. I think T. S. Eliot said that we only become great poets from imitating other poets, right? And that doesn't mean to copy their copy their work and make it your own though, but it does mean that like you learn more and more about crafts um, based on those people that influence you. So I don't think you have to have to stray away from that. I'd say lean into that. Yeah. It's that's a hard one because you just want to be careful that you're not gonna your story's not gonna be predictable. Really? It's not gonna be um, just the uh, just sort of like something people have seen a thousand times before. Um, and the, but it's really hard. It's like when you're writing music for the first time or whatever you're trying, you, you know, there are chord progressions that just work. And so um, I don't know if that metaphor works for you if you're a musician, but basically, you know, you, what you really want to do is use those familiar things to help your story. But if it's feeling predictable or tired, then that's not helping your story. So you kind of want to use the stories of the past just to help you. Um, but if they're holding you back by kind of, I don't know, making it predictable, then that's, yeah, it shouldn't be late. Totally. I don't know. And hey, uh, we have probably last few questions. So please submit those last few and we will do our best to get to them. We have two okay. here. Which one do you want to go with? Right hand, oh left gosh. hand. Wait, let's look. There's, there's three. Three. There's um, four. There's four. There's five. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, we're take two. Um, so some of the secrets of craft. What are the best advice for seeing at the beginning? Of, oh my gosh. So let's let's do this. You're one. doing that one. We'll do this one. I'm trying um, to do design team to do this one. Okay. Okay. Ooh, this is, we, maybe we can do three. Okay, okay. Let's, let's do three. Okay, okay. All right, so this one's simple. Sorry, can't help. So how does the post-it note system work? Is it similar to mind mapping? How does the post-it system work? Let's just show you. I mean, it really is, it really is. The thing about the post-its, we might seem crazy when we write on them and post them on things and then write on another and post them on things. But the really cool thing about post-its is that it gets your ideas out of your head. We just exist within our own brain so much, and it's so important to find different ways to get physical and invite others into what you're actually saying. So for us, the post-it process is really just a way for us to start bringing those ideas to life and being able to share them with others, right, so they don't just exist in our own brains. Yeah, and also when you do that, other people can react to them yeah. and build on them. Yeah. Um, you can move them around, you can restructure things more easily, so it makes ideas less rigid. Um, last thing is you can easily throw them away. So if you're getting too attached to your ideas for too long, that's also not a good thing. So the post-its gives you the freedom to explore and kind of go big, um, but also know you just kind of have an easy way of letting go because you haven't spent a lot of time making something beautiful. Amazing. So I'm going to ask you okay. your last. Which one was the one? This one? I'm asking um, you this? Yeah, you're asking. Okay. So this question is, I'm trying to get my design team to adopt this process. Are there any tips? It's an awesome question. So my experience with the whole design process is, is that if people are into it, they're going to be into it. And then if people are uh, just the sound of the word the post-it, or um, you know sharpies and the design process turns them off. They're just going to be mentally close to it. So it depends what kind of work environment you're in and how open you think people will be. It sounds like you don't think people will be open to it. So there are ways that you can use the exact same things and not bring a post-it into it, um, or even bring the term design into it, and then reveal to them later. Hey, by the way, I learned this um, because sometimes people. Uh, you can use this process to work within your existing cultures and work environments in a really powerful way. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and only you know that best. So focus more about the process and less about the like techniques that we use if you're finding that there's a lot of resistance. 
Um, focus more on the fact that people are iterating and changing and not being attached to their story and you keep improving upon your story in short sort of cycles and feedback cycles, then you're focused on the exact like, you know, process of putting things up on a board. Uh, so that's my sort of feedback is like, you really do have to think about your culture and how open people are. So um, use the tools. Yeah, and I mean, and I mean that, that's totally right. And sometimes you can demystify some of the design language around it, right? If you want to introduce some of this stuff to your team or organization, like maybe it's like, I want to invite feedback early and often. That's a powerful thing that really any team or organization could benefit from. So maybe it's not coming at them with like, oh, this is the des this is design thinking and this is the, the building my storytelling and telling prototype. Meet them halfway and kind of unpackage that language and say, actually, I just want to have more sessions where we bring our work to each other and ask for feedback so we can move it forward. Because that's something that just resonates with everyone. So find that core. And I think that's the that's the challenge, but also the reward. And the biggest thing you can do is just do it. Do it. So inviting a team of people together to go over your story and where you are in that process and introducing that you're very early on in that process is a very powerful thing if you work in an organization where things are not shown until they're so beautifully polished. So changing your culture or your team's behavior or perception of this stuff really takes you just jumping in and doing it and not talking about it at, you know because it's more about um, you know doing it than it is talking about it that's really powerful totally that's a great question thank you too okay what's the best advice you received as a beginning storyteller Whew. the best advice I think the best advice I ever received was just to embrace it um, I think it was a really weird moment in my journey and my career when I was able to say I am a storyteller, I'm a writer. Um, I think I tried to back away from that from so many years of my life, but it brought me such joy. And I remember, and I probably didn't heed this advice when I received it, but it was 10 or 12 years ago, and um, a professor had just said, just embrace it, you're a writer. And I think that that allowed me to grow into what I wanted to be and no longer make excuses and think about what else I could be doing and just realize that this is something I'm passionate about. And I think with storytelling, you need to be confident and believe in your own voice. So to kind of be able to stake your claim and just say like, you know, Walt Whitman said like, sound your barbaric yap over the rooftops of the world, like do that. And just like make sure that you can just say, I'm a storyteller. And I think that that's something that the more you say it in front of the mirror, like the better you feel, the more equipped you feel, and, 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 and the better your craft is. What about you? Do you have advice? Is there a can put you in the spot? <laughs> I thought that was your question. <laughs> um, okay. or, or who influenced, or who no, influenced I, I'll you? Say, I'll say that I, I was working on this documentary, and um, for years I'd worked in broadcasts where there were all these rules. Mm -hmm. You light this way, and you shoot this way, and you have this space here. And then I worked with a cinematographer on a documentary who lit everything the wrong way and did everything the wrong way and she was an amazing cinematographer and I talked to her about it I said this is not how I was taught to do anything and she said there are no rules about this where do people come up with these rules just do what moves you have an intention and a reason for why you're doing it and then go for it and that just gave me this whole freedom of we can tell stories in ways that break all the rules and in doing that we can actually tell the best story for that, you know, best story, um, for, tell the story in the best way for that story, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So don't be hung up on rules and conventions. Don't let that hold you up. Let the story drive you. So if it's supposed to be darker, if it's supposed to be more humorous, let that drive you more than what are the conventions or the tropes or the sort of formulas here. Um, and so that lesson, you know, there are no rules. Those are just all made up anyway. That gave me such freedom as a storyteller. Yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah. something that like super resonates with me. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. And so, and thank. I mean, thank oh. you, thank you all for for sitting with us today and sharing some of your time, sharing your questions, yeah. and 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 more like also thank you for being a part of this this learning community. Um, watching your stories evolve and unfold, and y'all's interaction has been so inspiring for us here. So really, thank you so much. And it's been so cool being able to sit with you even for 45 minutes and share some of this experience.
And uh, I think you have. We can't give you hearts, so we're giving you. Yeah, hearts, hearts back to you. I'll and do your homework. I'll draw you. We heard that too. you haven't all been doing. No, I'm kidding. Just do your homework for tonight. Thank you, you all. Thank you all too. so much. Thank you. And yeah, enjoy it and be storytellers. Go make some impact. Thank you. Bye.